It was a long song, yeah. Mm. Normally I try to pick one with maybe one or two verses there, but I think I slipped up there with four verses. <laughs> but it's pretty music and it was well done. So I hope you have your outline sheet in front of you, and we're going to be continuing in our study of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> As uh, I entitled them, What Happened to the Ten Commandments? They seem to have disappeared from uh, the United States of America in almost any form uh, that we might see anywhere. The only remnants I think left are perhaps some monuments that uh, certain towns and cities have allowed uh, to uh, have sitting outside their courthouse or federal building, maybe, not, no, no federal building, of course, but uh, uh, the, uh, let's see, the Supreme Court course has uh, Moses out there and the Ten Commandments in stone written above there. So that's the only remnant we may have left. Anyway, in our continuing study, uh, we come to what is called the Third Commandment. That's found in Exodus 20, verse 7. But it's also found in Deuteronomy 5.11. If you ever want to look at it there, the Ten Commandments are there. You might say, why are they in two sections of Scripture? Well, uh, it bared repeating to the Israelites. So about 40 years, I believe it was 40 years later, when Deuteronomy was written, uh, Moses repeated for the people of Israel the Ten Commandments. Uh, there's a little variance there, but nothing in the, the meaning of, of uh, the commandments. But as we study the Third Commandment, it's really a very short one. It's just uh, one verse here, and uh, it may be short, but it is sharp. And it carries with it a serious curse. A lot of people pass this by. Uh, it's a curse with a promise from God that he will punish all, none excluded, who break this commandment. Can you imagine this? Even just one time. That's what God has said through this commandment. And it appears that this one command, God wants everyone to take seriously uh, because in a sense, uh, if uh, we in any way are careless with respect for this name, God is very upset with that. Now, in a sense, I can understand a small portion of it, and I think you can too. For instance, your own name or my own name. Uh, how do you feel when somebody you meet meets you and uh, then goes off to announce your name to someone and completely mispronounces it? Or they write it down somewhere and they completely misspell your name. Uh, how would you feel about that? Now some people say, well, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But yeah, it does. Uh, it will make you feel a little bad that they didn't take the time to learn your name and maybe take the time to see how it's spelled if you're going to write it out in front of people or something of that uh, point there. So, in other words, little respect for your name uh, really brings a little distaste in your mouth in the process there. But how much more for our Creator Himself, if you think about that as well. Now today we're going to look at this third commandment here, and we want to see what God thinks, what uh, God wants, and what God says about this, and what He's going to do to those who abuse and misuse His very name. So let's just read it. I don't need the... Uh, uh, what we call the special reading of scripture, which is always very interesting to hear, uh, because it's just one simple verse. I'll read it, then we'll pray, and then we'll open up this verse for you today. And here we go, the first verse, uh, verse 7. Moses says, and writes down what God spoke, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord God will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Let's pray. Father, indeed, I just pray that as we look at this commandment here and find out what it actually means and how important it is and, and an application of it, that we might come away from here with great respect for your name. Maybe we'll even find that in some ways we've abused your name and have not thought about it. But at times also, maybe we have abused your name in a very poor way as well. And for that, we certainly want to ask your forgiveness. But nonetheless, Lord, if there's anyone out there today who will be listening uh, through the Internet or even in the assembly here who finds that uh, they need to call upon you for repentance and for forgiveness, I pray that you will bring that and enable that to be a reality for them. 
But for anyone who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, may they know that without Christ in the heart, there will be no forgiveness for anything at all, and only the fearful looking for of judgment to come. But thank you, Lord, that you have taken that judgment through Christ for us on the cross, and we have been forgiven of our sins. So today, as we look at the commandment, may we understand it to make application for our own personal edification. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you've got your outline sheet there, of course, and uh, we're going to look at three things. Uh, the commandment, its authority, uh, the name chosen, and the name cautioned. And then we're going to look at an analysis of this commandment, its substance of abuse and also a sense of abuse there, and also seriousness and subtle abuse. And then finally, its application, honoring his name by our words and honoring his name by our witness. Let's take a look at that now as we begin, all right? It's authority. Now remember the Ten Commandments were the beginning of what God said was going to be a special covenant. God struck this covenant long ago, actually, with their forefather, Abraham. And the promise was that when his children would multiply, that he would follow them and he would bring them into the blessing that he promised Abraham, that he would give them the land for his inheritance. So the type of covenant God made with Israel was, was not something that was uncommon to the people of Israel. And the reason for that was that whenever God spoke to people, he would speak to them in the language that they knew. He would speak to them in the concepts in which they lived by. He wasn't going to make it uh, so hard that they wouldn't understand him. He would make it very simple that they definitely would understand him. So the covenant, of course, was... Something very common in the ancient world of that day, and that was whenever uh, an overlord would make a covenant with the people, uh, a contract of relationships of some sort, he would specify in the contract his right to do so, and of course the authority by which he would make that commandment. And that's exactly what God did with the Israelites. God spoke all these words, and he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. So God introduced himself to his people by declaring what? Verse 2, his holy name. And of course he was Yahweh, the sovereign, eternal, ever-living, ever-powerful, omniscient, and omnipresent Lord and God. That was enough for them to know about right there. And God specifically recounted to his people when he had graciously done for them. He had brought them out of Egypt. No one could have done that. Only God could have done that. And he brought them out of the land of slavery because Egypt was nothing but slavery for them. And now he reminded them that he was their ever-living God. He was an active and loving God. He was a God who cared for them. But above all, he was a holy God that they needed to respect in the process there. Because he would by no means permit and allow sin to ever be gotten away with. That is the breaking of his laws for life and living in the land that he was going to promise to give them here. So, here was this direct covenant maker now working on their behalf. And some uh, lessons ago we went into the name of uh, God. He said, I am the Lord your God. The word Lord was the word Yahweh. The word God was the word Elohim. And when you put the two together, it was Yahweh Elohim. And that's important here. Elohim was mentioned over 2,500 times throughout the Old Testament. You could go through the whole Old Testament. You will find that singular name of God. But interestingly enough, in the Hebrew, it's not in the singular. It's in the grammatical plural. And the scholars tell us that that means that God, although he is a singular God, and of course the Shema, which the Jews would recite whenever they pray, they would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Amidst the polytheism around them, their God was a singular God here, and he indeed was a multifaceted, unified, singular person at that. But that singular personhood was totally unique, as in time, God revealed himself. He revealed himself in the Spirit of God. He revealed himself in the Son of God. 
He revealed Himself in the fatherhood of God. And so, in the New Testament came forth the triunity of this one God. And we know God now as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And indeed, that is our God. So, Yahweh Elohim. This is the one who was making this covenant with the Israelites. And that name, simply put together, means I am everlasting, ever-living, eternal, everlasting, all-powerful, mighty, the singular, supreme, and infinitely holy being. Now, with all those things, Moses continued to tell the Israelites that when you heard this name of God, you were to fear this very God. And of course, that's what he said in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, fear this glorious, fearful name. What name? The Lord your God. Now, today when people hear this third commandment quoted, of course, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses this name. Many per people think of it as God just didn't want you to use his name as a swear word. Well, there's truth to that for sure. But nonetheless, it's much more than that, as I'm going to show you today here. Uh, much more than a vile swear word that God was against. And of course, although it's part of it. So, before we dissect the third commandment here, we need to understand the importance of that holy name of God. Particularly uh, when he used it on behalf of himself. And so, indeed, fear this glorious, fearful name the Lord your God. Now, you know, I was thinking this week, when you think of names, and you look around our United States of America today, what is the most referred to name going on today? Well, some people would say, well, President Trump's name. Well, Mrs. Pelosi's name, right? Or something like that. Or maybe we'll go worldwide to Queen Elizabeth's name of England. Well, the answer is no, none of those names. The answer is the name of God is the most used name, and specifically, Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, these names are used more than 99% of the time as a curse word. How sad, how terrible, how horrible. And yet, Moses was telling his people and us that God's name is a special name because it carries what? His personal identity, all that God is, all that God has, that's in the name, and that's in His name. So, if you use this name frivolously, or in any way as a curse is common today, we fail to, fail to realize that this is a serious violation of verse 7, which is the third commandment itself. But most importantly, the way anyone uses God's name today convey, conveys how a person really feels about God. And that's true. The way you speak about God actually conveys how you feel about God. So the Israelites, what were they to do with the name of God? Well, they were to be careful to uphold it, to respect the name. And if ever to refer to it, it was to be used in a way of absolute reverence, in a way of holiness, of thoughts and actions, whatever they would do. Why, even the Lord Jesus taught that, if you remember when we studied the book of Matthew, remember the book of Matthew? It, uh, the Lord gave the Lord's Prayer. Now, he didn't want us to pray this uh, perfunctory in some memorized form. It was a model for prayers. It was to say, whenever you address God the Father, whenever you pray to heaven, this is the things that you are to include in there. And notice what it says. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. How? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it goes on in that way. Now this word hallowed is an interesting word in the Greek. It means to greatly, not singularly, but to greatly revere and to honor something. To hold this name in absolute awe and great respect. So when you pray, that's how you are to address God. Now, of course, since God is already holy, He doesn't need to be uh, prayed to be made more holy. That's not what it means here. What is necessary is that every creature would recognize and acknowledge the extreme holiness of God and His purity of being. We don't think of it that way. So this petition 
petition, I say, should focus on that very thing, God's reputation. And people need to hallow it and treat it as such. And this is what the Israelites way back in the Old Testament were to learn about God. The God who saved them and was preparing to give them what? A new life and a new heart in a land that they were going to. How wonderful it was going to be. So indeed, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. You know, Isaiah uh, told the Israelites this very thing. And he said, I am the Lord and that is my name. God spoke to him to write it down. I will not give my glory to anyone else nor share my praise with even carved idols. Now think about this. Maybe you don't, and maybe I don't this much, but God takes his name very seriously. And that's why the third commandment is probably one of the most serious commandments that God expects to be obeyed of all the commandments that he had given. And he tells us that his wrath and his anger will be upon anyone who is guilty of breaking this, seven, uh, this third commandment in verse 7 here. And that's why God gives a severe warning. In fact, God cautioned the Israelites to be ever careful in referring and using and applying his name in speech in any way whatsoever. Now, was there a specific penalty? Because he says he will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name? The answer is yes. There was a specific penalty for breaking uh, the third commandment. And it was to abuse, misuse, or speak in vain his name. God said he would hold them accountable and would receive the severest judgment and punishment. Do you know what it is? Here it is on the screen. Levit Leviticus 24, verses 10 to 16. I've condensed it a bit here. Now a, a fight broke out in the camp. That's in Israel. The son of an Israelite woman blasphemed God's name with a curse. So they brought him to Moses, saying, what are we going to do with him? He just blasphemed the Lord. And it's not Moses who said this. The Lord said to Moses, take this blasphemer outside the camp and stone him. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. Wow. That's what God said. Anyone who took his name and abused it and misused it and took it in vain or any way you're going to see as I'm going to show you in a little while here. God said they're worthy of being put to death. And under Old Testament law, that's exactly what happened. God is so serious, he would punish them with this very thing. Now, think about that. You know, I went through the Old Testament this week uh, because when I came across this one being the death penalty, what else did God give the death penalty for? I discovered there were 21 things in the Old Testament that God gave the death penalty for if an Israelite broke it. Think about this very thing here. Are you aware that under the law of Moses, if you lived at this time, you would be put to death for any of these things? Well, let's go over them. One of them, of course, is obviously murder, right? Number two was adultery. Number three was rape. Now, I'm not going to go to number four because when, when I went over these things, I started to think about murder, adultery, rape. Who in the Old Testament was guilty of all of those things? Someone you would never think. It was King David. King David was a rapist. You know, a lot of people don't think about that very thing. Some say, oh, well, you know, I re realize he, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Yeah, but Bathsheba was married to another man, and Bathsheba was a subject of the kingdom. And when this king would call for you to come to his uh, palace, he sent guards to Bathsheba and brought her to the palace. If that was you, ladies, how would you feel? You would be very careful about refusing anything the king wanted from you. And so that's exactly what it was. You know, I compared it in a sense today to what we would call today statutory rape. You know what that is. That's when an adult man would take a teenager, an underage girl, and he would commit fornication with her. Or adultery if he was married, I don't know. But the important thing is, our society to say, says even if that girl agreed to it, he would be charged with rape. Why? Think it over. Very seriously. Because this girl doesn't know what she's doing. He knows what he's doing. He's an adult. He's a man. 
and this girl is yet still in the formative ages of growing up. Well, Bathsheba was the very same. So in a sense, it was statutory rape. And Bathsheba was under the psychological pressure of the great power, so she acquiesced to it. Now, I was also thinking, all right, King David raped her. He had uh, sex with her. And then what did he do? He covered up his rape by being a murderer. He had her husband sent to the front of the battle to be killed, and he was murdered. So David was a murderer, an adulterer, and a rapist. Now, if all three of these things called for the death penalty under the law, what did David deserve? The death penalty. You know, God never, ever forgives sin. Did you know that? God does not forgive sin. If there is sin, the soul that sins shall die. The penalty has to be carried out. But the difference is, God can choose on whom the penalty will be carried out. For you and me, God chose His Son to die for your sins. So God didn't forgive your sins. He punished Jesus Christ for your sins. He punishes everyone and anyone for their sins if they come to Christ and they'll be forgiven. We know that. So what happened with David? David was forgiven his sins because God was going to bring the penalty on someone else. We know who that was. His firstborn child was taken in death. So God punished David and Bathsheba by taking his first child in death. And then think about this. If you want to read the story, go to the book of 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 12, verse 10. 10 there. It further says, Nathan said, David, death is never going to depart from your house. And the treachery of that sin will be with you until you die. And read the story of David. And you'll see that, 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 that came true. God punished David's family with death. For all of those things. So, indeed, David paid the price. Now, I don't want to stop the data, but I stopped there and I thought I'd share it with you. The next we discover is the person performing bestiality was to be put to death. Uh, anyone who committed fornication or adultery, anyone who committed incest was to be put to death. Anyone who commits homosexuality, and I don't care what the homosexual has to say, if you're listening on the internet and you hear me today, God says that you're worthy of death under the Old Testament. And I'll get to why God doesn't punish you with death right now. Number eight, worshiping idols. Number nine, blasphemy. That's what happened to this man we just talked about. All right, number ten, breaking the Sabbath. If you indeed broke the Sabbath rules. And then being a medium or practicing magic arts. A promoter of false religion apostasy, promoting belief in false gods, and human sacrifice, giving children to Molech, being a false prophet, parent abuse, physically abusing parents. Uh, that's a good one, isn't it? Cursing your parents. And 18, rebellious child. 19 was kidnapping. And 20, perjury. And lastly, reckless endangerment. Something like not pinning up a known dangerous animal and that animal subsequently kills a person. Both the animal and the owner of the dangerous animal were to be put to death. Think about all those things. All and important it is. Now, I went over this list and I started to think. If I were living in the Old Testament and my life today, from the moment I was born to my age right now, if, if I were to be judged for a any of these things, you know what? I would already be put to death. How about you? Have you ever taken the name of the Lord in vain? How about you committing any of these things here? You see? You know, 70% of our nation would probably be put to death because of that. So that brings us to think about this very thing here. God made business when it came to obeying His laws for society and living in His world with His protection and care. Uh, Ken, I'm going to ask you to go to the back there and pull that shade down. Uh, it is blasting me with the sunlight. I love sunlight, but not directly in my eye here. I'm trying to move around the way from Thank you so much. Okay, there we go. Now, with that in mind here, think about this very thing here. Uh, it says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. All right? Now, if you have a King James Bible, and it's a good Bible, 
It says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Now, vain is a good word, a you know, translation of the Hebrew word, but it's not the perfect word. It's a good word. Vain means emptiness and worthlessness. So in other words, to take God's name in vain means to empty God's name of his glorious content and to make his name irrelevant. God says you do that and you're worthy of death. But now, today, we have the New International Version and they've translated it with the word misuse. And I think that's a better uh, word because it covers much more territory here. Under this way, we can find out misusing the name of God goes even further than emptiness and worthlessness. Now basically, I thought about this, there are three ways of violating this commandment. And I'm going to go over them. And I want you to examine your own heart and life and see if you've broken God's uh, third commandment in any of these ways. Now the first way to misuse God's name is by your words. Of course, we've talked a moment ago about blasphemy, irreverence, cursing, and swearing. You know, these are the worst types of sins, I think, of taking the name of the Lord in vain. You know, I looked up uh, and tried to discover uh, any information on this, and I found out that uh, some studies were done. And in America, America has turned to breaking uh, the third commandment more than it ever has. Cursing and swearing and blasphemy is on the tongues of so many people in America today that was not in past years whatsoever. Do you know today, I believe it is said that at least uh, 90 words, 90 times a day, uh, the average person who curses and swears will take the name of the Lord in vain or misuse it. Can you imagine that? 90 times a day. Now, as a result of that, Blasphemy involves uh, cursing, uh, swearing, reviling God, in some way scorning him or mocking him and denouncing him and threatening and invoking his name in some way. You know what I'm talking about here. You know, someone is driving a nail and hits his thumb, the first thing is some curse will come out of, of the mouth. Or you're doing something, putting something up, and the thing falls down and crashes into pieces people will start swearing and using the name. Uh, we know what these names are, GD and Jesus Christ. Uh, without even thinking about it, God will be cursing as a process of that. But you know, cursing and swear words are even more than that. Some people will use words cursing the human body or bodily parts and functions. You know, I'm not going to mention them, of course, is the F word and the S word and the B word and the C word and the P word. I had to go over all these things. Um, <laughs> these are bodily parts and functions, and people think nothing of using those words in some way. But you know what? The human body is God's greatest creation. And when you angrily mock God by using those words in a filthy way, you're mocking the God who created it. And you're breaking this commandment. And the Bible warns us about these very things. For instance, in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, God describes you and me in the broken, sinful heart that we have. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongues practice deceit. And the poison of vipers is on their lips. The mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And maybe before you're saved, that's what was on your lips in some way. And Jesus said, but I tell you this, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word uh, they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. It's a wonder God doesn't strike us down right now for the way that we have spoken. You know, many have asked that. Now, if in the Old Testament, God carried out the death penalty for those 21 sins, and by the way, I wasn't invoking that anyone who commits those sins is any worse than any other, because if God gives the death penalty for every one of them, that means in God's eyes, all those sins were of equal value. So don't you put more value on one than another, that maybe you committed only one of those things and not some of those other things there. You know, why doesn't God do that today? And there's a very good answer. You know what the answer is? 
If God is so angry at the sin of our tongues blaspheming his name, people will ask, why doesn't he execute people today? Well, there's a good reason why. God is holding back judgment for sin now because it is coming in a future day. You see, God doesn't have to carry out his judgment whenever you expect it to be. He just has to be sure to carry it out, otherwise he isn't righteous. And that's why I said God doesn't forgive sin. If you've broken the law of God, there has to be a payment for it. But when God judges that payment, it's up to him. And you know what it, the Bible says in Romans 2, 4. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing what? That God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God is holding back his judgment. God is holding back the death penalty so that you might repent of your sins and be saved. Isn't God a wonderful God? That's why he isn't judging this world right now. Acts 17, 30 and 31. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. By the way, that ignorance, I put it on the screen there, is the limited revelation and understanding people had before Christ came. But once Jesus Christ came and revealed himself and spoke all the grace and mercy and goodness of God, the world is without any excuse. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. That's the Lord Jesus. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him, the Lord Jesus, from the dead. So today God holds back judgments. But those very judgments, all of them that were mentioned in the Old Testament, he's going to carry it out against anyone who has ever committed those sins against him. All right, now that's the hard use or misuse of God's word on his name. But then there's a subtlety that you and I might pass by and think, well, it's really not so bad. And that is in jest and frivolity. Think about that, how God's holy name is abused in this way. You know, the Bible says in heaven that when the angels come into the presence of God, for instance, in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 2, it says the seraphim cover their faces presence of God. That's how holy God is. But blasphemy, cursing, and swearing are not the only ways of breaking this commandment, but jest and frivolity as well. These are things like coarse jokes that use God or his name, or about his creation, or about heaven and hell, or about angels, or individuals in heaven like jokes about St. Peter, or something like that. Using the term of the man upstairs people think is, is not so bad in referring to God. But nothing in heaven is to be a part of any kind of joking or frivolity and invoking God's name in that way. And that manner of misusing it is evil as well. And the Bible says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And indeed, the psalmist says, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. But not only in jest and frivolity, it's also by careless exclamations. Think about that. You know what a careless exclamation is? Oh my God! Have you ever said something like that? You might have, right? Or others will say, good God, when they see something like that. Or, I swear, I'm telling the truth. I've heard Christians say that. Or, swear to God uh, that it's going to be happening. Or, God is my witness. Really? You're taking God's name in vain and misusing his name. These are flippant and careless exclamations using his name. God's name is a holy name only to be used in that sense. You know there's other euphemisms? You know what a euphemism is. You say something else, but you mean something else. Now, people sometimes will say, uh, oh golly, or gosh, or gad, or ye dad, Oh, by George, or by Jove, Almighty, uh, by Gee Whiz, or I wrote these down, or Cripes, or Jeebus, or Jiminy Cricket, using the letters Jesus Christ, J.C. And of course, Jiminy Christmas, or Jumping Catfish, those are euphemisms for God. Jeebus Creepers, Lordy, or Lord, all are substitutes refer to J.C. or Jesus Christ. You are taking 
God's name in vain. So be careful how you speak and what you speak. God promises he will not hold you to be guiltless. Now you might say, oh, well, wait a minute, I'm saved, I'm a Christian today, so none of these things will come upon me. Well, that's very true. You will not be held back from heaven because Christ has paid the price which is for all sin. But nonetheless, hell is off the books for you. Think about this. There are things that God will bring upon you for careless exclamations, for jest and frivolity, and even maybe blasphemy, and that is that you might receive earthly disciplines, as David did, or your place in heaven, uh, God's public rebuke will be before you at the judgment seat of Christ. All of these things. And of course, Matthew 12, 36 to 37 says, But I tell you, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every, what? Empty. The word is careless word they may have spoken for by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So think about that. By our words. But now there's a second way. By our acts. Hypocrisy. False lifestyles. Piety. You know, when we openly make a statement with our mouths using God's name or person, think about that, and then we don't carry through with these very things because our hearts are not behind it, well, then we've taken God's name in vain. You call yourself a Christian if you're saved. Therefore, you are using the name Christian or of Jesus Christ. Are you living up to that name? If you're not, you're taking his name in your person by abuse. Now think about that. Uh, many false lifestyles and piety. Sometimes you see people coming to church carrying Bibles. Unfortunately, you don't see much of that anymore today. But many years ago, people carried Bibles to church. But... When they went home, it didn't mean anything there. They acted and lived ungodly. Uh, some of them went to nightclubs or watched pornographic uh, dishonoring videos or partying. Or they simply participated in some ungodly relationship. These people, they claim to be Christian, but their lives don't match up to that. So if you're not living in a way that brings the Lord Jesus glory and you carry his name, you're taking his name in vain. And you're misusing it by claiming to belong to the Lord. Now there's a third way as well, and that is by our vows. Think about that. There are about 30 biblical references to vows I, I noticed in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, there's a place for an oath and a vow. I believe that. In the life of a Christian, as well as other forms, we call them promises, right? We take promises, contracts, something like that, or agreements. We all make them in some way. Maybe it's to buy a home. Maybe it's to buy a car. Maybe it's to get a credit card, something like that. Maybe it's to take out a loan. Or maybe a vow. We all took vows if you're married or uh, you're getting married. Some of us have even taken Christian vows. You went through the waters of baptism, right? And you made a pledge that you were going to walk kindly and rightly with God, Jesus Christ. Some of these things. These are vows we take. How faithful have you been to keep those vows? You know, frivolous and rash oath-taking or promises of sin. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 6 says this, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest, my vow was a mistake. Mistake. Did you make a vow to give a certain amount of money to the Lord every week? Have you fulfilled that vow? Have you been faithful to that vow? Have you made a vow to your spouse in some way, fashion, or form that you would do this or that for them and you don't keep your vows? You made that vow in the name of the Lord because you were a Christian by the very fact you wrote it. Matthew says, But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. So without being absolute sincere in your vows or your promises to, to do what you promise to do or pay, you are breaking the third commandment. Indeed, how sad, serious it really is. Now, of course, Numbers 30, verse 2 takes us to see what swearing is to be in the first place. 
When a person makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate oneself by a pledge, they must not break their word and must do everything they said. And that's what a vow really is. So the principle is clear. Uh, basically, don't make a vow except, except for perhaps a, a wedding or something like that in any way. But if you do, you've made a serious commitment uh, to the Lord. Keep it and honor it at all costs and how important it is. You know, you look into our nation today and you can find out that there have been many promises made by people, right? Private, unpaid debt is completely ignored by so many people. People think filing for bankruptcy frees them from paying their bills. Well, it might under the laws today, but not under God. If you're a Christian and you file for bankruptcy, let me tell you, you owe every dime of what you pledged and promised. And you should be making every private way of paying back your debts for your debt. At least making an effort to do those very things. Private unpaid debt and bankruptcy are mounting so high in America and it's going to ruin our nation. I really believe it. The chief cause of personal debt is dishonesty. And further, personal breaking of marriage vows and other sorts of promises is all because of sin. Refusal to keep what you promise. So as a Christian, make sure you've kept every vow, every responsibility, every promise you've made before God and before man itself. You know, the third commandment in Exodus 20, verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Uh, John MacArthur's Bible commentary makes a note on uh, the third commandment. And, uh, and what it says there, and I'm going to quote it, for the believer in the church age, however, the use of the name of God is not a needed verification of one's intention and trustworthiness. Why? He says, since the Christian life is to exhibit truth on all occasions, one's yes, meaning yes, should be, and one's no, should mean no, and nothing more than that. That should be enough for you and me. And so that's what James says there, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. So, let's quickly go over the last point. Honoring His name. How can you and I honor God's name in a wonderful way? Well, first of all, with your words, right? How you speak. You should speak with honesty and you should speak with truthfulness. Nothing else should be coming out of your mouth. And that is the truth of honoring God. No lying, no deceitfulness, no dishonest and careless and frivolous words should ever be there. In fact, the Bible tells us to guard against those things. The writer of Proverbs, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity and keep corrupt talk far from your lips. So speak with honesty and truthfulness. Number two, speak positively and with purity. How important this is. The writer to Philippians says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It goes much further. Speak about these very things here. And so, if you have an attitude of gratitude, that's exactly what will come from you. You'll have a positive uh, speech and purity in your life. And that, of course, will make all the difference. So the question is, is what you speak approved by God? Is what comes forth from your mouth upholding or denying God's word? Hopefully, it's upholding God's word. And if you do those very things, you'll be carrying it out. And here's one more, a third thing. By our witness, of course, we will honor God's name by speaking evangelistically. Now think about that. Why are you not in heaven? When you were saved, why didn't God take you immediately to heaven? You have no answer, do you? But actually you do. He left you here to be a witness in some way with your life and with your words. God wants every Christian to be a witness. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, don't they? And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine where? 
before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, look for ways to shine out uh, God's goodness and grace. And when you have opportunity and it avails yourself, speak to others about the Lord and find a way to do that. You know what's one of the easiest ways to do? Carry and distribute Bible tracts. That's right. Carry them in your purse, carry them in your pocket, and always be ready to hand out a tract to someone or to leave it somewhere and to pin it up, right, on those bulletin boards or something like that. People will take them and read them. And many people have been saved through a tract ministry. So that's one way to do it. But of course, openly talk to others. Tell them what's happened in your life. What has made your life better? What has caused you to be who you are and why you are? What has caused you to have such a positive outlook in life? Tell others about that very thing. And then when you're all done telling them about Jesus Christ, hand them that tract so that when you leave them, they can read further about the salvation experience. And then there's a third way, of course. Your witness can be invite others to worship the Lord. Now, sometimes you'll be somewhere where there's no way you can invite them to your church. But then think about that. You might know another good church in an area where you are. Invite them to attend that church. Give the name of the church and say, go to this church. It's a good church. And, and set yourself up there. You can come visit us, but it's far distance away. But nonetheless, do that very thing. You know what Paul says in Romans 10, 13? He goes on to say, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice that. No one will be passed by who calls on the name of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful there? How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one they, whom they have not heard if they haven't heard? And how can they hear without you or me preaching to them? So, yeah, this is why God has left you here on the earth, to be his witness. And every time you speak the wonderful words of the Lord, you are honoring the name of God and the holy name of God. Now, if anyone is misusing the name of the Lord, of course, they're going to be held guilty. So the point of all this, if I can leave you with one thought, is God takes his name seriously. You should, and I should too. And doing all these positive things will bring a great blessing from the Lord in your life and to the lives of those around them. Now as I close, I think of this. The, uh, the angel in heaven, Revelation 14, 7 says, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. How wonderful it is that you and I have a prayer hearing and answering God. You and I have a, an almighty, gracious, mighty, loving, omniscient, all-knowing and caring God who will listen to every word you speak. He will never be too busy to hear you speak to Him or to tell Him about others who need Jesus Christ. So the third commandment is a really important commandment. And you and I can be the ones who uphold it more than anyone else. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the word, and thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that is always there for believers who have a sorrowful and a contrite heart. Maybe we've broken this commandment in ways that we've never thought about it before. Maybe through the use of euphemisms, and maybe through uh, uh, exclamations that sometimes roll off our tongue. Lord, I know about that. I sometimes say to my wife, did that come out of me? Lord, forgive me. I don't know where that came from. But I do know where it came from. My old nature and my old heart. In there is nothing but, as Paul said, filth and vile things. But I pray, Lord, that the goodness of God that has led me to repentance will be manifest in my life and heart for others to see. And I pray the same for my brothers and sisters here. And I pray for anyone who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that today their mind and heart has been opened to see Jesus clearly. That He is the one who is the Almighty God, who's come to earth to pray for our sins so that God's forgiveness could come to a lost world. And I thank you for Jesus dying for the sins of the world and also giving us the gift of eternal life. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone out there today 
who needs that gift of eternal life, that they will reach out and say, Lord Jesus, save me from my sins. And you will hear that prayer and answer. Together we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.